And welcome back to God Talk. Well, one of the big changes that came from this midterm election happened in Iowa, where voters, in an unprecedented move, uh, removed three Iowa Supreme Court justices from office uh, because of their unanimous decision that legalized same-sex marriage in the state. And here to, to discuss really the judges, um, the issue of the judges and the issue of you know who got involved with this um, is are Brian Brown, who's the president of the National Organization for Marriage. Uh, here and uh, and then on, and also Sean Eldridge, political director for Freedom to Marry. And Brian, I want to start with you, uh, and I want to get both of your takes on this. I want to start with you. Like, why was that, in your in your opinion, a good thing that these three judges were actually removed from the bench? I think it was a great thing for judicial accountability. The fact is that in Iowa and states across the country, voters have the right to speak up and either retain or not retain judges. And here, the judges had made a gross error. They'd imposed their view of marriage on the voters of Iowa, and they hadn't followed the Constitution. So, so in Iowa, the voters stood up. And for the first time since 1962, when judicial retention elections were first instituted in Iowa, the first time and only time, uh, not only one judge, but all three judges that were up for election uh, lost their seats. And I think it was a powerful example of democracy in action, of voters saying, enough is enough. Uh, judges should not be making the law. They shouldn't be imposing their views on the people of Iowa. And the people of Iowa said enough is enough, and they voted them out. Okay, and then, and then Sean, like, why was this not a good thing? Why was this a bad thing in your mind? Right. Well, let's talk about what actually happened here. This was okay. an attack campaign targeted at these judges um, with hundreds of thousands of dollars from out of state, groups from out of state, who were targeting these judges be because they didn't agree with them on one issue. These were judges who were appointed by Republicans and Democrats who had served their state well mm -hmm. um, and who were ousted in this really sort of sly way that had a lot to do with the money. But do you, but do you think it's a in. sly way? And, and also, it's not unusual, though, for national money to be coming into a state for a particular cause that they, that they think has national implications. And you saw it in California. We've seen it in Florida. I mean, you really do see that a lot. So, I mean, why in itself is removing judges not a good thing? Well, I think judges are a different situation. You know, judicial independence is at the core of the checks and balances that we have in this country. And mm -hmm. that exists because sometimes lawmakers get it wrong, sometimes public opinion gets it wrong, and ju judges are there to protect core constitutional freedoms, freedom of religion, mm -hmm. freedom of speech, and in this case, the freedom to marry the person that you love. You know, the, 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 the Constitution, though, doesn't say that. That's, I think that's the issue, drawing the Constitution into the idea about marriage, because the Constitution doesn't make any any ideas about marriage. That's, and I think that's why you know, we want to keep it you know, to... But the Constitution, what the Constitution is saying it's, the, it's the Constitution to freedom of uh, to pursue happiness, and it does talk about equal protection under the law. Sure. And what we're ultimately talking about here are loving, committed couples who have families who want to protect their families, mm -hmm. and a lot of this has legal implications. We're talking about city hall marriages here that give couples thousands of rights and protections and responsibilities to take care of their families, to take care of their children. Mm -hmm. It is about equality under the law, and that's definitely in the Constitution. Now, and, and, and Brian, basically, we, is your objection to this is that it was the legislators, I mean, um, the legislators didn't make the law. They're the legislative body. They're the ones who made the law. And the objection was that the um, judicial body basically was acting like legislators. Well, the, the court itself in the Varnum case, if you read the actual decision of the court, they themselves say this is completely unprecedented to view marriage as a, a two men or two women. So they know what they're doing isn't based upon the law. And the fact is that they weren't abiding by their constitutional duty to interpret and not make up the law. Now, same-sex marriage in and of itself is a very bad idea, and I think the voters of uh, Iowa agree with that, and that's, I think that's why they were ousted. But the other issue here is that uh, you talk about the fact that uh, a judicial independence and that sometimes the people are wrong or sometimes the legislature is wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes the judges are wrong, and mm -hmm. the judges were wrong here. They made up the law, and the people held them accountable. And the idea that somehow uh, the people of Iowa aren't smart enough when they see ads to determine what's right or wrong, I trust the voters, and I think the voters made the right decision. Mm -hmm. And the notion that this was out-of-state money, the fact is we have uh, 50,000 supporters in Iowa who said, please get involved. We're a national organization. And the the fact is that groups on the other side of this issue, Tim Gill and others, had put a lot of money into elections to make sure that the legislature didn't allow a vote. And George Soros has worked to not have judicial elections for this very reason. People are concerned that the liberal elite uh, may, may lose their toehold if there are elections here. That's yeah. wrong. Uh, I, I want you to answer that when I have a question for you. Go ahead, Anne. I mean, I want, to, I want to touch on this issue of judges getting it wrong. You know, mm -hmm. advocates of marriage equality, we've lost some cases. We've not won every case. 
But when we lose a case, we go back, we look at our arguments, we look at the facts, and we return to the courtroom with a stronger argument and a stronger case. We don't go around the country intimidating judges, um, attacking judges. That's not the way the judicial system is supposed to work. When you get it wrong, you make a stronger argument. I don't know about that, though. I mean, I just, I don't know about the lack of intimidation. I mean, I, I remember the stories after Proposition 8 passed. I remember the intimidation. I remember the, the, the threatening people of their jobs because they, you know, they, they, their names were released because they voted for Proposition 8. I'm not sure if you can take the moral high ground in this case. There's no question that this is a heated debate, that this is about people's lives, their family, their well-being. There have been, on both sides, heated moments. But that's different from saying, let's attack judges. Let's wipe out a Supreme Court because we don't agree with one issue. That's really unprecedented. And it really mm -hmm. should be troubling to Americans who believe in checks and balances. And, and, um, and my question for you, Brian, though, too, is that the, the, the idea that we have the judicial system is so that there is somebody to protect uh, uh, an unprotected minority. Mm -hmm. I mean, it happened with slavery. It happened, it happened with women. And they sometimes make unpopular decisions. So in this case, um, <laughs> Can you see the, the need for a judicial system to make unpopular decisions? No, of course not, because the analogy to the civil rights movement, for example, is, is blatantly false. Uh, two people have the right to live as they choose, but they don't have to, the right to redefine marriage for the rest of us. And the courts should not be attempting to make this analogous to interracial marriage. To, the attempt to hijack the civil rights movement for same-sex marriage is one of the reasons why so many leaders in the African-American community are standing up and saying, no, African-Americans by large margins opposed uh, same-sex marriage in California and voted for Proposition 8. This is a false analogy. And ultimately, when we have a division like this, when we have a, an emotional issue that, uh, that we feel very strongly about, we don't come out and say, well, because California voted to protect marriage as the union of a man and a woman, those voters are the equivalent of bigots. We don't get into name calling. What we do is we have a civil debate, we argue, and then we put it to the voters to decide. Mm -hmm. We should not have this elite, these judges, saying, we don't care what the voters think, we're going to do what we want. That's, that in and of itself is a, an attack on democracy, mm -hmm. attack on the basic civil right to vote. Sean, I want you to answer that. You know, at many moments in the history of our country, courts have stepped in to protect minorities against the tyranny of the majority. We've seen that time and time again. And I have a theory about why these judges have been targeted and why this is happening. It's because the other side, it's because groups like NAM have lost the argument. They've lost the argument in public opinion. We have two national polls showing majority support. They've lost the argument in the courtroom. And so instead of going back and making the stronger argument, they're, they're lowering themselves to mm -hmm. intimidation and attacks. Like, I, I've got to uh, um ask you about two of the, the points, though, because you talk about tyranny, and one of the things that has been happening with um, the, the, the gay marriage lobby is that it seems that there's no real rational discussion when people don't agree with you, there's kind of a, there must be homophobes, they must be, uh, you know, tyrants. There's no discussion saying, I just don't agree because I don't believe it's morally right. That's the discussion. Why can't we have that discussion? I mean, as someone who has this discussion every day, I don't see a whole lot of that. You know, there are extreme mm -hmm. people on both sides. But what I see is people bringing in their families, telling their story, talking about their years together, talking about the normal uh, troubles and the normal challenges they're facing in this economy and their daily lives like everyone else. That's what this discussion mm -hmm. is grounded in. It's about families. You know, every American believes in protecting their family. And now a majority of Americans realize that same-sex couples okay. want to do exactly just that, protect their we family. We have to wrap. Boy, this is a hotbed discussion. It's never going to go away. And I wish we could bring you guys, I hope we can bring you guys back I'd together again. And I'd like to much. talk to you again because I think it's just better to have just you two talking. <laughs> thank you. Great. All right. Thank, thank you very you. much. I want, uh, Brian, uh, Brian Brown from the National Organization of Marriage and Sean Eldridge, political director for Freedom to Marry. Thank you very much. This has been God Talk.